Okay, so hello and welcome for another episode of the Bitstocks podcast. I have here with me uh, Kostantinos Skansos, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, yeah. so which I'm going to abbreviate his name down to, to Kostas. Many people don't know this, but I'm of Greek descent myself and my uncle is called Kostas. So it's really convenient for me. Uh, although I couldn't quite pronounce your surname, that's where my Greek falls off a cliff a little bit. Um, but please, Kostas, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, uh, it all started in 1984 with my first computer, where it was a ZX Spectrum, Sinclair ZX Spectrum back in the day. Um, I literally coped in very, very quickly. I had my first program written in uh, within five, six days, without a manual, without nothing. And it had a part of assembly inside, ZAD, Zilog, back in the day. Well, uh, I began as a computer scientist. Uh, I was in IT for maybe 20 years. In the meantime, I decided to also educate myself a little bit better. So I became a physicist and biochemist. We have a, an open university here in Greece where you can simultaneously uh, finish all three uh, fields of uh, science inside that. Uh, it's well, called natural, natural science, science uh, the department. Um, after that, I became a bioinformatician. I uh, got a master of science in uh, computational biology and bioinformatics where uh, I wrote a paper about um, a theoretical computer uh, that could be built on uh, the blockchain. Uh, it's quite famous, to be honest, right now. So when, when did you write the paper? In uh, 2017. Okay, okay. Well, uh, it had to do with uh, some cellular automata, which is uh, a very basic form of uh, a, a digital cell let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was invented uh, uh, as an idea in uh, 1939 by John von Neumann mm -hmm. and uh, became materialized uh, in uh, something that we could touch uh, by John Conway in 1971 yeah. uh, with the game of life. Yeah. Very, very recently we found out that uh, these cellular automata could be uh, uh, also, the, some, some short of them uh, could be Turing complete, which means that they had the ability to, 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 to form a, a very a complex uh, Turing machine. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most impressive papers I've read on this uh, field is by William Gilpin. It, it is, uh, it's written in uh, 2018, if I'm... Uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken. But just to pause there, just to bring the audience really in, sorry to cut you off there, Costas. Um, okay. But just to bring an audience in, so you've written a paper on cellular automata, a different form of computation on top of Bitcoin. And for those who are watching, just a basic explanation of what CA is. Because Craig referenced it. I've had a podcast with Craig and we've spoken about it. Um, variety of people referenced it because obviously Stephen Wolfram is, is pretty much kingpin really in that subject matter uh, right now. Uh, so just for those who are watching, quite new to Bitcoin, we refer to Turing Complete and CA. Why, why are they important and why are they interesting? All right. So a cellular automaton is basically a digital form of a cell. We as humans... Uh, uh, are, are, uh, are a sum of cells, right? Mm -hmm. We evolved uh, from a protomolecule, let's say, and uh, through trillions of uh, quadrillions of mutations, we, we became what we are now, and we call ourselves intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. So if we construct something similar in a digital form, we can have similar um, uh, things coming to us in, yeah. uh, in a digital form again, throughout a computer. So it is a field of computation that is not very widely spread because I think that only one person in uh, the field is very, very uh, involved into this uh, science, which is Stephen Wolfram. Uh, 
he wrote a book, uh, very famous right now. Okay. And so I think uh, I actually got a copy of his book here. Hold on. Uh, here we go. So if anyone wants to take on the challenge of reading this, let me turn it sideways so you get to see the, the size of the challenge. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it, it is kind of complex because people do not understand how this actually works. So I, I will try to, uh, to, to explain that in, in, in LE5, if, if that's possible. It's a very complex um, uh, subject, so I will really try to... to to break it down for you. So a cell is able of uh, doing several stuff uh, within, a, let's say, a colony or a culture that we can, uh, a biological cell, we can build a biological culture that consists fr from cells, right? So we have a, a Petri dish that you put inside some cells and those cells are capable of doing several tasks according to what these cells are programmed to, yeah. to, to, to be, right? So if it's a somatic cell, uh, it, can, uh, it can turn, uh, let's say, uh, to somatic uh, functions. If it is a heart cell, it can start beating and so forth. So if we take this a step fur further and we construct something that is uh, the equivalent of this natural cell inside a computational uh, environment, then if we have some data that this cell can be fed through, then this cell can, became, can become intelligent, so to speak. This is very, very broad. Yeah, I, get, yeah, yeah, I catch you. So for this to happen, this uh, cellular automaton must be a special one. It must be what we say Turing complete. It must be a computer itself, yeah. so to speak. So we basically formulate a basic form of AI that we construct within the blockchain, and we have the ability to, to, to teach it from the data that we uh, store inside the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we broaden this into a bigger uh, field, uh, Right now, AI and deep learning is something that uh, is very, very popular because, you know, there is a great progress and we're going to, to go through, uh, through CoinGeek conference uh, next February. Um, the main thing is that we can do literally everything with AI. Imagine that we had to program thousands, thousands of lines of code to have a, a program that uh, is able to identify a car in the road. Right mm -hmm. now, we only have an AI that we uh, manage to teach from pictures to identify those, uh, those cars mm -hmm. in uh, zero time, very, very fast. So if you want to, uh, to understand what's at stake here, if we have several of those AI agents that we store it inside the blockchain. And the blockchain is used for transactions that can be anything from uh, storing books online, from having the weather online, from having stock markets, you name it. Then specific AI agents can be used to, to be teached from that, uh, we call this active deep learning graph right now. There's a term for it. Active because it keeps going as we go, uh, as we go. That means that whoever is using blockchain can contribute with their data mm -hmm. for teaching this AI agent. Yeah. So basically, as the things go further, we will construct a set of AI agents that are able to do several tasks. The most important part is that we can arrange some of these agents to collaborate with each other. So imagine, for instance, that you want to, to go from one, one place to another and a one AI agent is driving your Tesla, for instance, and it is able to check the weather at the same time. It is able to check the traffic and pick up which way is best for you and also at the same time to uh, have the ability to 
predict what uh, the traffic will be after 10 kilometers in, in, your, in your route. So when was, because you mentioned a quite a few different buzzwords there. You mentioned biology, you've, you've mentioned that influence in how you look at automata. Uh, you've yeah. then tried to simulate biology in a simulated environment, being a computer. Uh, in order to give you outcomes. So clearly nature seems to be quite an inspiration for you. Where was the penny drop moment, I guess, where you saw Bitcoin in the light or blockchain in the light that you can bring that thinking now and execute it? Like what, what's unique about Bitcoin and blockchain for the world that you're exposed to? Okay, it's very easy because I was looking for uh, something that would be able to, to construct a secure environment, first off, that it is, it is not able to be hacked. You know, one of the biggest burden that uh, the society will have to face in the near future is uh, that we will have some AI agents that are really, really powerful, right? Um, for instance, uh, we have wrote in the second paper that uh, we published with uh, Ian Grigg, um, uh, last August, which is very, very famous right now. Um, we, we, we have a citation about a scientific team from uh, China who, were managed, who managed to actually hack a Tesla while it was driving on autopilot mm -hmm. uh, on the road. So it, they, they managed to hack the auto wipers function, which is the ability for the Tesla to, to turn uh, through the lanes. Basically, you can hack this and kill the guy inside. Mm -hmm. So, but, then, but you know, honest, this has been a possibility though in variety of cars now since I think early noughties. As soon as we went to microprocessors in cars, they've all been hackable, right? Even before, even before Tesla. It, they don't have to be. That's that's yeah. my point. So, if you have a blockchain, then you have an immutable medium. That means that you will have to download the AI agent. And that agent will have a secure signature that is the one that you should be running. Absolutely. And if you want to, to be secure, then there is no, no, no more secure, uh, no better secure uh, uh, medium than I can, I can totally agree on that. And just to play yeah. devil's advocate a bit, because I've done a lot of work, a lot of thought process into the subject of artificial intelligence, uh, Bitcoin's role in all of that. Um, the biological inspiration of the design of Bitcoin, how deep that goes. So um, this is a great fit for me to have a conversation with somebody like you uh, because I've really meditated on a lot of these thought processes and all of, not all of those rooms are lit with light. Some of them are really dark rooms, right? So before I jump into maybe some of the issues around addressing AI, when you are saying AI, from what standpoint are you speaking? Are you speaking in terms of just pattern recognition uh, and just data filtering? Or are you speaking eventually emerging a general form of intelligence? Because these are very different subject matters, right? Um, what, 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 are you, what do you mean when you say AI? Okay. So AI is, uh, is a rather un unfortunate uh, term, term, uh, terminology, let's say, um, because we don't, we don't really have intelligent, artificial intelligence, with, because we cannot define what intelligence is, you know. Mm -hmm. We say we people are intelligent, but what is intelligence? So mm -hmm. we're talking about smart, smart programs, in, in essence. We are talking about uh, very fast and efficient programs that are able to do specific tasks like driving your car or uh, calculating complex uh, algorithms and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the holy grail of science right now uh, is how to construct a generic form of AI. So yeah. uh, in my humble opinion, blockchain might be the most prominent ground to build something up like that. And I will explain that uh, in, in a very short uh, time period. But I want to stay here because, you know, a generic form of AI is not able to be built if you have, uh, let's say, a specific data set 
that you wanted to learn from. Mm -hmm. So everybody should participate. A generic form, that means that you have all kinds of data inside and that data should be active because we tend to have, uh, let's say, uh, things in our lives that right now it's very good to have. Let's say we have, uh, how do you call it? Um, you have fashionable, let's say, uh, mm. items. Mm. But after two months or three months, those items will not be fashionable anymore. So this is the same with news. News are keep coming and after 24 hours, it's no, no longer news. Mm. So imagine something like that to be able to learn from the society, its habits, uh, its, uh, and, and the most important part, part is that these habits, this data will be absolute truth. It is not very convenient to lie if you pay for it. So micropayments is probably the way to build perfect data sets which right now it's something very difficult to acquire and very expensive to build. If you are a data scientist and you're trying to, to build up a, a good data set, you need to collect very, very carefully your data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about uh, dog pictures or cat pictures and so forth. I'm talking, you know, uh, medical data, yeah. uh, x-rays, uh, functional in MRI and so forth. If you want to do a serious job, you need to pay for it. So imagine that your data on the blockchain can be encrypted, private, and it at the same time can be used by AI agents, which you don't need to trust because they cannot use your data to do something that they will gain from. So do you see there being, say, ever a scenario where you've got in fact, two different scenarios. You mentioned the term agents, right? And data pools. And also we have to factor in that all intelligence knowledge on this planet comes from we organic human beings, right? So we are the intelligence that's feeding any form of AI system, right? So with that being said, AI is going to be some, it's going to be a reflection of who we are, right? And it's going to polarize who we are so if you have say in one breath artificial intelligence that can be if benevolent protected by the integrity of the blockchain right so that benevolent agent like what your example with tesla if you had a benevolent ai blockchain secured it can't be hacked or compromised that data set is it stays secure and it stays pure right well what about if i create a on the opposite side a cancerous, malicious, dictator version of artificial intelligence that's super malevolent, but I'll also locked it in my blockchain box so you can't compromise it. What does the world look like when you've got bad agents and good agents protected by the same technology? So, uh, you can do that, but it will be expensive. Mm. How so? Because you need to train it. Mm. You need to provide data so that you will do whatever you want to do with it. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have such a net entity inside the blockchain, using it will be first auditable. You can be audited at any time. If somebody makes a, a complaint to the authorities and say, uh, Michael has uh, done me this and this and this, then you can be audited because there is a paper trail on the blockchain. So it pretty much is like using a blockchain to do fraudulent things. Um, simply, it's not economic. Uh, in a short or long uh, time, you will be facing the consequences. So I think that it is possible, but it's not economic for you because everybody will know that this thing belongs to you. Mm -hmm. You used it for doing bad things to, to people. And yeah, and it, it traces back. And uh, so why has it, has it always been Bitcoin SV or since, say, the initiation of the SV thinking, at least going back to Genesis, 
Uh, so basically Craig coming back on the space, did this unlock the door of possibilities for you or was you looking at this prior to that moment? Because you mentioned 2017. Well, this was all possible to the original Bitcoin. Yeah. But uh, uh, the policy of uh, the programmers in uh, uh, BTC uh, restricted this, uh, this thing because first off, they blocked out some op uh, operations that uh, were originally inside and also they created a small uh, block size so that you could not actually load up with anything. And the most important part is the high fees. Yeah. Because if, come on, if you want to do a transaction and you have to pay, let's say, $70 to do that transaction, it's not going to happen. For, for anything. Yeah. Like literally anything. <laughs> so that was, that was um, um, prior uh, SV. I, I also humored the fact that uh, somebody didn't want something like that to be built. Uh, in, uh, in my discussions with uh, similar uh, scientists, I said, you know, I, I'm really baffled. We have a huge opportunity to have a huge uh, a computational device here that could probably solve too many problems and will be accessible by everybody anywhere in the world via microtransactions. And we, mm. we, we restrict it? Yeah. For what? And that's what I've been saying for years the introduction of SegWit and what happened to Bitcoin, irrespective of what it done, in terms of execution, was genius. It was genius because it killed what we're talking about right now. The possibility to create and do what we're talking about right now. And, and that's what killed Craig's swarm analysis uh, and the supercomputing uh, that he was doing on, on top of Bitcoin. He was running automata uh, on Bitcoin. Um, cellular like, automata 110 and, uh, one, yeah, yeah. and rule 30 and as well yeah. rule 30 as well and that to me for the people who are right at the top of say the malevolent side of the crypto space right so the people behind some of the more formidable companies blockstream etc i really follow the activities of the core developers and what they were really doing what they were up to and then you look at bitcoin from the perspective that you and i are discussing uh, today, it, be, it, it, it became very clear what they didn't want, what they were trying to prevent, and what they were fearful of. Because the way that I see Bitcoin and what we're doing here at Bitstocks is we're building a data bank, right? Data is going to be the world currency. Every single state of consciousness on the planet is a little oil field now, right? And what I think Bitcoin does beautifully beyond just this security aspect of having data integrity, I guess, is data pooling. Because if we think about what Google, Amazon, Facebook, any big, huge data collector out there, they have to use real economic might and business acumen to build a really dense data pool, right? And if their data pool isn't good enough, then they'll outsource, they'll go to Analytica or they'll go to these other companies to build out their, their data pools. But so then they'll run their pattern recognition against that data pool to then say, oh, my, my data set and my ability to read my data set means that my version of Alexa is better than your version of Alexa, right? Yeah. What I think is really interesting about Bitcoin is it, acts, it can act as one big cohesive whole, right? Because it flips the incentive where I'm now going to be a provider of data myself and everyone else is going to be a provider of data. Right. And that means that it represents what we really are, a collective state of intelligence. Then the question becomes, who can read it the best and curate it the best? Yeah. So there, there is another question here that um, if if somehow, you know, uh, if you ask um, my colleagues about uh, how the the thing is going and if we're going to have if we're going to have an agi sometime soon you will have various uh, various <laughs> angles of, uh, yeah, yeah. of opinions right so there is some people that say okay we are going to have it within the next decade mm. and some say you know we probably have 30 to 40 years 
some will say we will never have it mm. i mean you're a data scientist come on man <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> it's just like you go in, into into a doctor and say you know uh, when are you expecting to have a cancer uh, treatment they say mm. we're never going to have it so the thing is that you know in my humble opinion yeah what's your because progress is is forming in, is 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 uh, is an exponential curve and at some point uh, it becomes super exponential it's not predictable right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we are in that phase uh, okay. of of our civilization and i've discussed this with uh, several people and they all agree and um, the main aspect of this era is that we have the ability to extend our existence, not only our uh, intelligence. And we need tools for that. Tools that everybody and anybody in the world could use. If IBM or Google have, uh, has something like that, then it will not be accessible to me or you. Mm -hmm. It will be for them, a mm -hmm. closed society that will be able to use it. Maybe they already have it but it will not be accessible to the world. So I want to, 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 to emphasize here what is critical to my opinion. If one entity, whether that is a company or uh, an individual or a country, owns something like that, it will be a disaster for everybody else. Totally agreed. Totally, totally agree. So this must be built in a medium that will be accessible by everybody, Everybody will be able to use it. It needs to be a public there utility. Be... It needs to be a public utility. Like a globally exactly. public utility. Exactly. So I, I'm, I'm pro-regulation about AI because nobody talks about the elephant in the room. Everybody is talking about ethics and blah, blah, blah. What are we doing about it? You and I are going to have a great conversation when we eventually meet. Uh, and we'll blow, the lid of this, we'll blow the lid of this conversation and we talk in a lot more detail, but I couldn't agree more with what you just said. I really couldn't agree more with what you just said. And I feel like because this technology is growing at such a rapid rate and the implications are humanity changing, right? The fact that there is no regulatory oversight, there is nothing. Look how long we took regulate, look how long regulation took to catch up to Bitcoin. And we still haven't caught up. And Machine intelligence is one of those things where, like for instance, I would not call Terminators AI, like general AI. Right? That to me is not real AI. It is machine intelligence operating still within the rule sets, within confines, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. Now, my personal opinion is you'll never be able to go beyond Terminator stage taking the approach that we take today with science. And what I mean by that is in science today, there seems to be a egotistical arrogance when we observe, because we observe and we never factor that we are very part of the thing it is that we are observing, uh, which is why it always freaking changes the data when experiments are under observation, because we don't make this, this clear distinction. I'm observing me, right? And with that thinking, I think it's a lot more, I think there'll be a lot more breakthroughs around, okay, how does universal consciousness work? What is consciousness? What animates the cell? What is the cell? What's the image that contains all, right? This is, this is another big, big conversation. I know, right? That's why I said we can have it in private. <laughs> but it's all resonance and frequency matching. So if you create, for me, in my opinion, you create a artificial biological device that can signature match to consciousness, then you've got something that is AI. But it's not really AI because it's the same thing that powers us. Well, let's not go there because it's a very, <laughs> <laughs> very, very big conversation, really, really. Um, but I, I, will, I will stand at your point where... Uh, well, I find it's, this is very important. So mm. we don't know what consciousness is, right? Mm. 
Uh, this is a very big, big question that neuroscientists have been struggling to find out. Some say that uh, it is uh, emerging through the network of neurons that we have inside our brains. Some others say it's uh, something that uh, might have external, uh, external source that we as uh, uh, people are connected to. Uh, really, we don't know. There is a lot of science behind, behind this and we probably need about, I don't know, 100 years, 300 years, I don't know. But we can have something that is very, very close to that. That means that, come on now, we have, we have agents that you can talk with uh, your keyboard and have a meaningful conversation. And you do not understand if they are humans or if they are machines. Mm -hmm. They can fool you for a little while. It doesn't matter, but they can fool you for a little while. I, I believe that Amazon has now um, an Alexa uh, competition that it, uh, it, uh, it has to do with 20 minutes of actually having a conversation with oh. an AI agent that uh, whoever manages to do it, it's basic, basically it's... That's more than good enough for most use cases. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's you know it's the Turing test. Yeah, you cannot you cannot uh, you cannot really tell if this mach this is a machine or this is a guy or a lady uh, uh, on the other side of the line. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're we're not quite there, but we are approaching and we are approaching in a fast pace. So let me uh, hold a bit back and say that uh, throughout science we have something that is unique and uh, inalienable truth. That means that no science can ever be complete. It's the incompleteness theorem from uh, Kurt Gödel that uh, it's uh, 1921, if I recall correctly. So basically what this theory said was that no theory can be complete on its own. Take, for instance, mathematics, right? It can formulate problems that within the mathematical theory cannot be solved. So what do you do? You have to inject a new set of axioms so that you extend this theory, this scientific field. And then you have a bigger theory that is able to solve the old problems, but itself, it will be still incomplete because it will formulate new problems that they will be insolvable. So AI is just like that. It's a Gödel expansion. But then the question becomes, do you reckon that there is an ultimate formula that splits all the chaos and establishes the order? Because that's what you're referring to, right? Because a lot of these boxes that need to be open, AI, energy, um, a plethora of different things, it really all boils down to unlocking that same one Pandora's box that then activates all of this subject matter that we're talking about uh, right now. It, it's, it all kind of goes back to, I guess, what Einstein spent the second half of his life trying to achieve, a unified model, right? That just really explains the physics behind all of these subject matters that we've just discussed today. Yes. Uh, the thing is that well, we need to, to invent a new set of axioms so that we can have a unified model so that we need to extend our science. So AI might be that Gödel expansion, we don't know. We know for a fact that Bitcoin itself as a technology is a Gödel expansion itself. So imagine that you have these two unique set of axioms and you put them together so that you expand all the fields of science. It will be monumental. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's beautiful to hear someone else speaking so passionately on these subject matters. Um, I was actually deeply challenged and concerned on the subject of AI and also Bitcoin's role in it a good few years ago. And I even questioned, I don't even mind saying this on camera, I questioned if the actions of Blockstream was a good action was killing the possibility of AI a good thing? 
right? I very quickly concluded that they were on the negative side and they were killing it because this was the opportunity to be a benevolent uh, version of, of uh, artificial intelligence. But I, I think it's a subject matter where everyone needs to kind of drop the ego, really tap into discernment and ask themselves what they want their role in this to be because the implications are incredible credible for us. Uh, we are moving into the next industrial revolution where automation and machine learning is going to be a huge part of it, a huge, huge, huge part of it. And I'm actually, whereas say a few years ago, I was had quite a naive and negative view on AI. I now really understand and appreciate just how important it is in the simplest form of what technology is being, say, a car allows a human being to travel long distances without having to use your feet, right? So technology is a liberator of, of man. And I genuinely feel that if this is done right, then the labor aspect and the burdensome task of what we have been doing as a civilization can be outsourced and it will allow humanity to be what I genuinely believe we are, and that is creative beings. And this is why I'm saying that our, our state of consciousness really is our oil field. And if you offload a lot of the labor and allow your creativity to flourish and not limit it to, say, a bank balance, but it's now limited to your own state of creativity, um, I really do think that's going to genuinely unlock a huge new paradigm for what we call the human condition on Earth. Um, exactly. So it's, 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 it's beautiful that a lot of people now are really getting pumped up and excited about applying this now to Bitcoin SV and Bitcoin, because I do think we need to get our act in order, right? If we want to start being a competitor or deemed a competitor to Google, to Facebook, to uh, Microsoft, Google, and the like, we have to show that there's an, an, another option that serves and serves very, very well. Otherwise, it's going to be so easy for the masses to just get so integrated into an Alexa and Google Assistant and Siri world, which we already are. Well, I'm, uh, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, all the individual uh, uh, scientists are doing a bad job on uh, working to, into this field. On the contrary, I, I very much appreciate their jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want it to be accessible to everybody. So if we form a, a new monetary system that is able to support something like that, imagine that it's, it's going to be a new revolution. Mm -hmm. And it will be accessible to everybody. You don't have to pay uh, nobody to use it. You will have to pay your, your, your own application to run on, on, on micropayments, and then that's it. And there is a huge amount of data that we use every, every day. I mean, look at the supply chain of a city, of a company. Look at uh, the, the, the transformation of transportation for something like that. Mm. You could have drones that uh, moving people Absolutely. from one place to another. And you could do it with uh, the blockchain. You could have your ID uh, with, uh, with your uh, signature there. And they will know, the, the drone will come pick you up and go from point A to to point B and it will be secure and... Absolutely, and at a much lower scale, I mean, I've got two kids. I've got a three-year-old and I've got a five-year-old, right? And they're just, crazy. yeah, <laughs> thank you. And they're just running around the house, just crazy, right? And yeah. it would be so much easier if I can just put Nest cameras in every room, right? But the reason why I don't do that is Alexa's the back end, right? Google's the back end or Amazon's the back end. So you got Google or Amazon, I can't remember which one it is, but... I know that that data stream, I don't have sovereignty over that data stream, right? You never, you never did. You never did. You know, because the main misconception in the world right now is that uh, you get something, let's say a TV set, a smart TV, and you say, you know, this is free for you. You can have a smart TV for free. And nobody asks why. It's because you are the product. Yeah, you are being spied on. You're the data. Yeah, you're, you're the product. 
yeah, yeah. Nobody, nobody sits and asks itself himself why this is so huge, why Google is uh, is worth so much, or why Facebook worth so much. Mm. It's because they're selling your data. Cambridge Analytica was only a part of the story. Mm. And I'm not saying that, you know, this is something that will stop, but we really should do something about it. 100%, 100%. Uh, well, I think that's a great cliffhanger to round up on. Uh, I would love to do a part two on this, maybe in person when you're in London uh, for, for CoinGeek. Definitely love to welcome you down to the office and we could do maybe a part two on this in person and really kind of lift the lid up. Um, but before we sound out, uh, Kostas, would you just like to tell everybody where they can find you, how they could contact you, um, and yeah, what potentially is you're going to be speaking, out, speaking about at CoinGeek? Well, um, uh, I don't have a personal web page. I'm a, a scientist in the form of uh, more like a hobbyist scientist. I, I very much like what I do. Nice. And uh, nice. I have been a researcher for almost all my life. Uh, I began as a hacker as I told you, <laughs> and I believe that uh, the, the greatest hack is to hack my own life. Yes, yes. So um, in CoinGeek, I will be talking um, together with uh, my co-author in my latest paper uh, in, uh, on uh, artificial intelligence implementation on uh, the blockchain, which, uh, as I told you, it's very, very famous right now. I didn't expect so much uh, impact. Um, more than 8,000 people have read it so far since wow. uh, August. Wow. Uh, yeah, too many buzzwords. I've actually yet to read it. So um, now 8,001, I'm going to download that paper. Uh, I'll read it. <laughs> I'm going to read that this evening. Um, but honestly, genuinely, Great energy. There's so much I want to talk to you about, but I kind of want to switch up the camera before I do that. <laughs> um, and yeah, just uh, excited to do this. Uh, again, I'm definitely excited to meet you uh, next month at CoinGeek. And I'm just glad that so much of this thinking is now being concentrated with what this community is doing now with Bitcoin SV. I really think we're going to make up for the lost time we've had in a lot of the manipulation and the kind of games that's been happening. And uh, just, just minds such as yourself now can apply themselves to a project and deliver something clearly that you seem very passionate about, which is a, a artificial intelligence that is going to serve humanity, uh, which is awesome. I commend you for that, uh, Costas. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this has been a pleasure. Uh, and as always, guys, until the next time, peace, love, and light. See you guys at CoinGeek. Costas, thank you so much, mate. Appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. It was really a pleasure. <laughs>